So now let's join our featured speaker, Ian Vanson, on the history of the Soviet Union secret police, the Soviet Union's primary secret intelligence agency during the Cold War. The KGB joined, gained notoriety for its widespread global espionage. And let's not forget Paul Kodak for the history that Russia's, of Russia's first green-based vodka that was distilled at a local monastery in Moscow in 1430 up until today's vodka. Do you think that's what, what's in our in our drink? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, both Ian and Paul have gained have delighted our audiences with their insights uh, for several town halls, and they've gained a loyal following. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Ian. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, that looks like a delicious, if probably not much taste to it, drink you're enjoying there. So, while I um, share my go about figure out how to share my screen here, there we go. Um, I thought we'd start, so yeah, a little detour to uh, Soviet Union. So quick quack, pop quiz, see how quickly, it, see if you know the answer uh, before I tell you. Uh, how many republics were there in the USSR? Uh, it took you too long. The answer is 15. Um, and rather than make you try, try, anybody try to name them all, I'll just show you. Here they all are. So it's a big, uh, it's a big happy family. Um, so to sort of set the stage, I'll do just a quick recap. Soviet Union starts after the Russian Revolution in 1917 when the, the Bolsheviks come in, overthrow the Tsar. Civil war ensues. It's a pretty chaotic time with the uh, Bolsheviks fighting with uh, the White Army, which includes diverse interests of monarchists, capitalists, social democrats, other rival socialists. Um, there's a lot going on. Uh, the Bolsheviks are trying to, you know, to consolidate power. Uh, Russia is going through many many ch -ch -ch changes um, and they decide they need a capable security force to try to get control of things. So they create the Cheka, a secret political police. This is the kind of the original KGB. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go through the history of it and uh, how the organizations changed over time. Um, so it starts off with the, with the Cheka. We're gonna check out the Cheka here, the original Soviet secret police organization, you could say. Um, headed up by this like, delightful gentleman, uh, Felix Sosinski, uh, aka Iron Felix. Um, the, so the group was basically established to protect the revolution from reactionary forces, because in you know, the early days there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of chaos. So stop protect it from re reactionary forces, class enemies like the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, the clergy. Um, but you know it becomes a, obviously a tool of repression against all political opponents of the regime. So naturally, the things they do include mass arrests, imprisonment, torture, executions without trial. Uh, it grows very quickly from a few hundred to over 100,000 agents in a couple of years. Uh, and it's, it's kind of crazy. They didn't really answer to anybody or have to follow any laws. Um, <laughs> and they made such a mark on society that they, even after the group changed its name, they, people would still refer to the secret police as Czechists. Um, it's a term that still gets used today. So yeah, so Iron Felix uh, here is, um, oh, and I should mention that, that Cheka is actually, is just sort of an abbreviation for the, um, the full name, which is there, which is an all Russian extraordinary commission, which is pretty cool sounding. So Felix is interesting because he was born in Poland and his family were actually wealthy landed gentry, uh, yet he became a communist. So, you know, when that's the case that he's gonna be pretty committed to the cause. Um, so he was involved in Marxist political groups in the Baltics during the Bolsheviks in 1906. Um, as a political dissident, he himself spent a lot of time in prisons and labor camps, including Russian czarist ones, uh, beaten by guards enough to uh, apparently cause permanent disfigurement of his jaw. Uh, he was actually in prison in 1917 when the revolution took place and he was then freed by the Bolsheviks, uh, then becoming a trusted lieutenant of Lenin. Um, uh, hence is in, being entrusted with taking over the, with, with starting this, this Cheka group. Um, and then shoes on the other foot. Now he's going to apply the same uh, brutal methods that were used on him on, on others. So now it's time for him to do the torturing, uh, especially in the, um, the red terror campaign initially in those, in those early years of 1918 to, to 22. So Things start to settle down a little bit in 1922. Um, the USSR gets gets founded by the the initial um, the, the initial four republics, um, and uh, the the group kind of gets reformed a bit. Now it gets turned into the state political directorate, or GPU. 
which we'll move to next. But first I wanted to also point out um, Iron Felix, as he was called, it was also the nickname for this statue on the right, this giant iron monument in Moscow that's now gone, was literally made of iron. Um, but this bust of him in Minsk uh, in the center is still there, so you can see it. Um, but moving forward to the, uh, to the GPU, which became the OGPU, uh, formed from the Cheka in 1922, uh, also run by Iron Felix. Uh, and on paper, this was supposed to be a little bit more restrained. Um, so uh, like, you know, not as many executions without trial, uh, bringing people before a judge uh, occasionally. Um, and so it's still run by Iron Felix. You can see on the right in the picture uh, until his death uh, a few years later, and then it was taken over by the man in the middle, Menzinski. Um, and then the guy on the left, far left, Yagoda actually took, when, once the group had changed his name again, was, was in charge. So all of them, you know, buddies here in this photo and each ran it at a different time. Uh, Medzinski also graced the cover of Time Magazine on the left, as you can see. Um, so yeah, it started as the GPU, then it just, they added the O when it was expanded for the whole Soviet Union, not just, uh, not just Russia. Um, and so this is an intelligence, state security service, secret police, uh, but they are operating both inside and outside the Soviet Union, persecuting political criminals and opponents of the Bolsheviks. So that includes, you know, the Russian emigres that have left the country, but um, are, are working to, to against the communist regime. Um, so, you know, for example, something that they did was um, pretend to be a group within Russia trying to overthrow the government. Uh, and make contact with Russians that had left the country that were that were doing that, and, and uh, so fooling them and getting them to send money and supplies, and try to lure them back to Russia. Um, and so their biggest success in this was actually luring the famous spy Sidney Riley uh, to come back to Russia. You know, pretending to be this anti-communist group, but gotcha, it's actually Iron Felix and his guys. So um, Riley was captured and executed. Um, also around this time, Stalin emerges as the new leader after Lenin dies in, in 1924. And so Stalin really uses this group to engage in intense investigations of any opposition uh, as he's trying to consolidate power. So they set up the gulag system. Uh, you know, they're, they're very involved in persecuting religious groups. Um, but uh, the, they event, eventually, and there's another um, sort of reorganization in 1934. Uh, and the group dissolved and, and reincorporated into the larger interior ministry uh, or Commissariat for Internal Affairs, as it was initially called, the NKVD, becoming the Directorate for State Security within it. So now we move forward to the group is now within the NKVD. Um, so the NKVD actually had been established in 1917, uh, initially just for, for Russia and then for the rest of the Soviet Union to conduct po a regular police work. Um, uh, but when, once they bring in um, the once they bring in the um, OGPU, now the group is actually in charge. They have a monopoly on on law enforcement at this case, in this point. So both ordinary public order and secret police. Um, and these guys are probably best known once they brought in the secret police uh, for carrying out the Great Purge of 1936 to 38 under Stalin when he got uh, quite paranoid and there were a series of large trials of former senior party leaders, a lot of executions. Uh, There's like estimates of 1.3 million people being arrested, maybe half of them executed for crimes against the state, the gulag population tripling in a couple of years. Um, but so uh, that, you know, that, that's a, that was a, <laughs> a big undertaking. But in addition to the domestic work, they, they, they were also active internationally with espionage networks established in every uh, major Western country. Um, and they even had a unit uh, overseeing, uh, overseeing um, uh, assassinations of political enemies abroad. And so that includes personal rivals of Stalin, such as Trotsky, who you see on the right. Uh, with his wife, um, who was chased around the world uh, by the NKVD until arriving in Mexico, which is what he's doing in this picture. Um, he's actually accompanied there. You see behind them the artist Frida Kahlo. Um, she and her husband, Diego Rivera, were communists. And so they helped bring Trotsky to Mexico. Um, and uh, Trotsky actually had a brief affair uh, with Frida um, before the NKVD caught up with him and uh, killed him in Mexico uh, with an ice axe in 1940. The guy in the middle, uh, Beria, 
uh, was was the chief of the NKVD during World War II, um, and there, it was obviously very active during World War II. There were other groups involved as well, um, but Beria kind of made his name then. Joined the Politburo in 1946, so very high up in the ranks. Um, but uh, in 1953, everything changes. Stalin dies, and in that big shakeup, uh, Beria loses power, uh, ends up being executed, um, and there's a reorganization after Stalin and Beria are dead. Uh, of the internal ministry, the NKPD, and that brings us to the KGB, uh, the Committee for State Security. So the big change here now is it had been put under the interior ministry. Now it's brought out once again to be an independent uh, group um, under in 1954 under the man in the middle, uh, Ivan Serov. So Ivan Serov is pretty, uh, pretty interesting too. So um, had been in the NKVD during World War II carried out mass forced deportations of groups in the Baltic to Siberia. He was actually a senior figure in Smirsch, the wartime military counterintelligence group. He was helping set up the Stasi in Berlin after World War II. Um, and then after his time in the KGB, went on to head the GRU, the, the military uh, intelligence group, um, but also eventually fell from failure or fell out of, uh, fell out of favor. So KGB, um, interestingly, it's it's you know, it's got its, its big responsibilities for you know, internal security um, and uh, the intelligence, counterintelligence, but it also has troops within it. Um, so military units separate from the armed forces, including the border troops, signals troops running communication, um, special service troops doing cryptography, cryptography and signals intelligence, and even has its own uh, Spetsnaz uh, groups. So major, you know, major functions are you know, internal security, um, uh, which includes you know, working with the local services of satellite states to, mo to monitor uh, opinions, prevent revolutions uh, within the Soviet bloc. So they're working to crush the Hungarian revolution in 1956, the Prague Spring of 1968. So for instance, in the Prague Spring um, in Czechoslovakia, they were infiltrating with agents to spy on the new government, planting subversive evidence to justify the invasion that followed. So, you know, it's the same playbook they use of uh, planning ev evidence that right-wing groups aided by the West were trying to depose the communist government um, and basically preparing pro, uh, you know, the, the right people uh, to assume power once the invasion takes place. So making, making the way for the Red Army, which then rolled in. Um, and then obviously within the Soviet Union, combating anti-communist groups, religious ideas and dissidents, uh, infiltrating dissident groups, uh, you know, doing smear campaigns and show trials. Um, and abroad, they're active recruiting intelligence sources, discrediting enemies, um, doing, and, and, as well as still being, being active in things like um, in Afghanistan. Uh, there were some of the, um, some of the, when they, when the, right before the Soviets went in, they, uh, with the army, they sent in a smaller group to assassinate the Afghan leader who was, uh, who was not a friend of the Soviet Union at the time in 1979. And so the assault team they sent in to do that included um, the men from the, from the KGB's Spetsnaz groups um, to, uh, to lead the assassination. Um, and on the right is, is Lubyanka, the, which was the, um, the headquarters of the KGB and now is uh, where the FSB is located. So where this all kind of um, leads is, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with uh, kind of how it's reorganized today. Um, so it's, it's a little bit broken up now. So you have the, the FSB, um, which is kind of the, the, the main um, successor uh the, it's, it's, this is the federal security service so it, but it's it's primary re, primary responsibilities are internal counterintelligence internal border security counterintelligence and surveillance so that means neutralizing foreign espionage safeguarding economic financial security and combating uh, organized crime and terrorism so they're headquartered in that that lubyanka building um, and the director of the SF FSB answers directly to the president of Russia. Um, so in the middle, you have the SVR, that's the foreign intelligence service. So they're the ones that are really tasked with intelligence espionage outside of Russia, uh, working together with the GRU, which has been around all this time, but that's the, the military um, uh, counterpart. 
Uh, and then on the far right, the FSO is the Federal Protective Service. So that's providing protection to high ranking state officials. And that was actually part of the responsibilities of the KGB. It had pretty wide ranging, uh, I think beyond what we generally recognize uh, roles you know, from border security, protecting you know, party officials. So it's been broken up a little bit now uh, today, um, but, uh, um, but still, still very active. Uh, and after that whirlwind tour through um, the, the history of the KGB, I think I need uh, I think I need a drink. So, uh, uh, Paul Kodak, do you have any you have any recommendations for me? I do uh, one particularly, but you might not be happy about it because um, the Soviet tactics, the political and economic monopolies, the KGB. Um, anything to maintain control of the population actually have a considerable connection to the history of vodka in Russia. So uh, let me share my screen and I can tell you all about it. <clears throat> all righty. So <clears throat> vodka in Russia. Um, now, oddly enough, as most uh, origins of alcohol goes, historians and scholars don't really know the exact origin. There's still debate on the beginning um, of vodka as we know it today. And that's really because there isn't much of a traceable history to um, the region at the time. Uh, now, Russia, Poland, even Sweden have pretty good claims to make, but we'll focus on vodka in Russia for today. Uh, what is known is that um, for many centuries prior to the vodka that we know today, alcohol distillations were made. They had a very different flavor, a color, a smell, but they were made particularly for medicinal uses. Um, <clears throat> uh, from a medicinal capacity, alcohol is a great disinfectant, antiseptic. You can reduce your fever with it, uh, you name it. But in the late 14th century, a uh, type of distilled liquor came to Russia, and it was more similar to the liquor that would later be referred to as vodka, uh, the Russian word vodka. It's said that Genoese ambassadors brought this aqua vitae, uh, or the living water, to Moscow, and they presented it to the Grand Duke uh, Dunskoy. Now, aqua vitae became the predecessor, really, of all modern strong alcohol uh, including brandy, whiskey, schnapps, Russian vodka, Polish vodka. Uh, the liquid that was obtained as a result of distillation, it was originally from grape must. It was thought to be a concentrate and a spirit of that wine, which really resulted in the reason we refer to liquor oftentimes as spirits in English and Russian. So around 1430 in Moscow at the Kremlin, um, there was a a particular monastery called the Chudov Monastery. And within that monastery was a Greek monk named Isidore who was being kept as a prisoner. That's it. Now Isidore, uh, legend has it, he allegedly produced the first genuine recipe of Russian vodka while he was being detained. <clears throat> uh, he knew not, or he had special knowledge of distillation processes. He knew how to really purify the distillation a bit more. And he made the first recipe of the beverage to a higher quality than the aqua vitae that Russians were accustomed to. Now this recipe for a long time ex uh, resided in Moscow, no other regions in Russia or Rus at the time. And it wasn't until really the 18th century that uh, it began to uh, be, be re uh, realized and recategorized as what it is today, vodka. Multiple terms were recorded for that before. Some were called burning wine, some were called bread wine. Uh, really, they were all kind of the same precursor to vodka. And the word vodka was actually used, but uh, it wasn't used for the drink. It was used more for a medicinal tincture. Uh, and vodka is really a Russian word or brought from a Russian word, uh, voda, which means water. It's a diminutive of water and, and um, it has its ties to the aqua vitae as well, the, the living water that was brought originally. <laughs> but vodka in Russia, um, going forward, the, the consumption of vodka really rose in uh, Russia slowly from the 1430s. 
but it wasn't until the 16th century that Ivan the Terrible showed that leaders could really use vodka to their advantage. Um, here's Ivan depicted in the famous painting by uh, Ilya Repin with his son. Um, but uh, what Ivan did was he banned production of vodka by peasants. All alcohol was the property of the Russian crown. It could only be produced and sold by the Russian crown. He created a network of taverns to serve the drink, to funnel profits to the state. And because of the ownership of uh, the drink, vodka became very expensive con to consume. Uh, so much so that by 1648, it's estimated that a third of the adult male population was actually in debt to these state-run taverns. Uh, the taverns, really with the alcohol flowing, the constant state toast to the czar and to the state, uh, and the indebt indebtment of the patrons, uh, really helped to influence the Russian masses and effectively stifle any sort of public revolt to their conditions under the Tsarists uh, at the time, which was a good thing as far as the leaders were concerned. So Ivan on, uh, Russian leaders really continued to use vodka and their power over it to influence the country. <clears throat> now, going back to the previous mentions of the actual word for the drink versus the medicinal tincture, the first written usage of the word vodka in an official document referring to the vodka as we know it was in 1751 um, when Empress Elizabeth regulated ownership of all distilleries to the state. Instead of granting lands and territory later on, Catherine the Great actually granted nobles the much sought after um, deeds and, and rights to vodka production and distribution. This was lucrative. This was, this was better than land. This was money. <clears throat> um, now, by the 1860s, the policy of promoting uh, consumption of state manufactured vodka uh, really made it the drink of choice that exacerbated the massive alcohol problems already throughout Russia. And then in 1863, the government um, production on vodka was, uh, the monopoly was actually repealed, which caused prices to drop. However, the government continued to tax it at an incredible rate. So this was actually very good for the, the, the crown at the time. Uh, it's said that under Tsarist Russia at the high points, it could produce up to 40% of the state revenue, keeping the czars in power. Uh, really until 1917, when uh, the Bolsheviks in the early 20th century um, <clears throat> began to revolt, they espoused prohibition. Uh, in fact, Vladimir Lenin referred to the alcohol as a vice by which the bourgeoisie subjugated and controlled the proletariat. <clears throat> now, those, uh, uh, rise to power really didn't hold. Stalin brought back vodka production. He brought back um, the essentially dulling of the masses. Uh, he kept a lot of his own cabinet, his own political um, sway within a shot glass, um, got his rivals as well as his uh, allies drunk and, and continued to conduct business from, from a bottle. Um, now, <clears throat> that all being said, along with the KGB activity, um, really was to the detriment of the Russian society, but uh, alcohol consumption continues on in Russia um, as we see it today. And it's not all tragedy, it's not all control. Um, in fact, there is a Russian version of, of tapas called zakuski, which is probably one of my favorite ways to drink vodka. Uh, and the idea behind zakuski is that um, it's really derived from the two main rules of drinking vodka, uh, never drink alone and never drink without eating. So traditionally, when you would welcome guests from the cold, uh, you give them a warming shot of vodka and then to protect the stomach um, from the bite of the vodka, you follow it with a bite of food. Now, the dishes range all over the place. They're cultural. There's pickles for the harsh winters. There's cultural foods. There's foods uh, that became part of the Soviet culture as, as more countries were absorbed into the Union um, and have still persisted. There are also very modern takes on Zakuski dishes. But really, the, the main idea for it during the Soviet regime was that it was actually your social differentiator. Um, the Anya von Bremsen, who mastered the art of Soviet cooking in her book, uh, said, we really have no housing to speak of. We had no cars to speak of. We all wore the same clothes. So the way you would actually show status, show power, hospitality, uh, your emotions was through food and through making a lavish Zakuski table. Uh, she went on to say that it's a little embarrassing uh, if there is any tablecloth visible through your massive dishes. 
And the way to do it going forward for all of you who want to partake is um, you prepare your table of food, uh, you pour your vodka and you shoot it in one. Russian vodka is not a sipping vodka and you do not exhale. You immediately eat something to kind of like stun that taste of the vodka. Uh, and really, that's how your evening proceeds from then on out. A shot of vodka, a pickle, a herring, a uh, bellini, caviar, whatever. Um, rinse and repeat. Keep shooting and keep eating. Um, so as, as vodka really is the fabric um, woven into uh, Russian culture uh, to really better and worse for, for the Russian history, um, it's important to realize that uh, vodka is, is not solely Russian, but Russians are uh, considerably uh, close to vodka. So the next time that you pour a glass of vodka, remembering to shoot it in one, even if it is not a Russian vodka, because actually the U.S. Uh, imports of vodka, really Russian imports only accounted for less than 2%. Not many vodkas are made in Russia these days. Um, the next time you pour your glass, at least... Uh, you know, look how clean, neutral the spirit is, raise it to your friends, raise it to your food, uh, think about the history, and give your resounding toast of Zazdrovi to your health. Uh, I'll stop there because I know we're close on time, and I will give it back to you. Well, thank you both Ian and Paul. That was really great information. I'm ready to take a shot of... Uh, vodka and <laughs> yeah, <that laughs> have so some cool. food maybe some uh, croissants I don't oh know. yeah that was great